Okay. So now it should be recording. Um, yeah, so I thought that first we could kind of go over the contract. Um, there's a big list of questions there that the students are gonna be looking at. A lot of them are questions that I think if you were to only focus on one, you could spend an entire semester looking at. So I was thinking that maybe we could identify one or two key questions that we would really like to prioritize and bring to the students as an area of interest. Um, I'm happy to put up the questions on the screen if that would be helpful for everyone. Cool, okay. I will so, share Hannah, my screen. Hannah, might I, might I indulge you for a moment um, on the agenda? Um, because we might lose power, and because I have a super busy day, I, this time of year for for me in particular, my job is super busy. Could I just do like an overview of the semester and then leave you to your discussion? Um, I I don't need to participate in you all, you know, shaping um, your thoughts on those questions. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I can really appreciate that. Yes, you could spend a whole semester on any one of those questions. So. Um, yeah, is that okay? I I, I want to go ahead yeah. and um, sounds like a good strategy. That would yeah, be great. Me, Thank you. Uh, let me fix my screen situation here because I'm one of those people that has 40 million things open. There we go. So I will share my screen here. Oh, I might need to make you a co-host. Okay, it should work now. So let me do this. And my favorite learned Zoom thing was, um, oh. And it looks like Joyce just joined us, just so everybody's on the same page. I'm gonna let her come in and then we can oh. do a quick hello. Hi, Joyce. Joyce, I love that you wear that hat. I'm impressed. It just makes me very happy. It's great. We're loving your hat. Um, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, so it's the two weeks of the year I get to wear it. <laughs> Where did Elijah go? Nice. I, I'm I'm still here. I'm just uh I need to take everything on my end. I'll be I'll be right oh, back okay. video wise. You're still present. All right. Yes. Yeah, no problem. I always figure somebody's, you know, like stood up and they don't have pants on at the. Sorry. Or something. You know, not quite that bad. Yeah. Just, uh... <laughs> don't want to make people watch you drink or, you know, there's all yeah. kinds of reasons. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry Joyce... to watch me drink. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's too damn bad if you don't like it. <laughs> well, Joyce, I, I'm from the Conway School, CJ Lammers. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, thank you for being here and for your interest in this project. Can you just introduce yourself, where you live, and kind of your role in the town would be helpful? Oh, sure. Um, my name is Joyce Palmer Fortune. I, I am a fellow select board member with Julie, uh, and I've been on the select board, gosh, this is probably 12 years now. I took six years, did a sabbatical, came back for six years. <laughs> so, uh, so that's sort of the pattern. Um, let's see, in the town, I live on Westbrook Road um, down in, in Southern Waitley, if you can get that from my accent. Um, <laughs> let's see, I think that's probably the most important um, things with respect to the town. I also teach physics for a living um, down at uh, Smith College. So that's oh. my other, the, the other side of me. Oh, that's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I, I wanted to go over kind of the milestones uh, for the project. Let me put it into a bigger picture context real quick because I'm a planner and I like the big picture. Mm -hmm. So the students, we have 18 students every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the winter, we do six projects. So if my math is right, three students are assigned to each project. And for a planning team, that's that's a good number and uh they will communicate with you they have one email address for their project so they will communicate with you through that email address so you will not be getting emails from three students okay so we want email address and it oh sorry i was big picturing it so it's three semesters 10 months i'm trying to hook in elijah here 
10 months, $40,000, which is less than half of a master's degree and cost in other places. And it's a master's in ecological design. And we're accredited, we're a 5013C. So, um, and students graduate with three portfolio projects. So they do a small scale project in the fall. We did one in Waitley for the Veterans Memorial a few years back. And then in the winter, we do large scale planning projects, big thinking like the one we're talking about here. And then in the spring, they do um, small, uh, it's still large scale design, uh, but it's more design focused. So designing parking lots and trails and uh, parks and just you name it. Um, so they get an experience at three different scales. Okay. So this scale being the winter term is big picture thinking. So while the students are going through the process of doing your project, they are simultaneously taking courses in planning. I'm one of the instructors in the winter term. Uh, there's also a part-time planner, uh, I mean, part-time planning faculty that's there even more than I am. Uh, so they get taught by, by faculty as they're going through this, and we all help them out with their projects. So every Wednesday, I go in one o'clock, and all the teams have to do a presentation of how far they are along in the process. Okay, so um you know it's, i think it starts the third weekend so the third weekend they're like we've had our first meeting with our client we've done some research you know this is where we are and so they learn presentation skills along with how do i summarize the information that i have so far what are the gaps all of that kind of stuff the the process is just really um really amazing to watch over the course of a semester so Let's talk uh, specifically about uh, this project and the dates for this year. So these are a little bit uh, flexible. Actually, we know better now that this is the 10th and the 12th is the first client meeting half. Oh, it says this week, but we know that those are uh, January 10th and 12th now. Um, the students are gonna prepare uh, what we call a memorandum of understanding where they basically more in their own words, look at the contract and clarify any questions. And your discussion about clarifying the questions today is going to be really helpful to them. So um, that'll happen in that uh, in that first meeting, and then they'll write an MOU uh, and get them signed by the end of January. And all this time, they are doing deep dives into research. So. I'm imagining that Hannah's gonna be one of the points of contact and that'll be great uh, having someone that, um, you know, they can communicate directly with like that. And then by February 4th or so is the first community and stakeholder meeting. The faculty likes to call this scoping and I said that confuses people, um, but it's really about, you know, are we looking at all of the right questions? You know what I mean? Like, are we looking at the things that really matter? Are we, is it, you know, where are the gaps? Um, it's all that kind of thing. And you'll see a lot of uh, analysis, you know, SWOT analysis, you know, the, what's, what's old is still a uh, good practice kind of thing. And you'll work with them to uh, figure out the format. It could be, all Zoom, it could be hybrid, it could be in person, depending on COVID situations at the time. Uh, we've asked all of our clients to have available a hybrid setup, if we can. So that's that's really the best uh, tool, I think, at this point, given I just saw a news um, bit this morning that COVID numbers are back up. And then this is gonna be right after the five colleges people come back from break traveling all over the place and there's always a spike in the valley after that so um you know we want to be careful uh, around that for our students as well so um anyway uh formal presentations if you have mark on your calendar if you haven't already february 24th that's a friday um and uh it's a one hour time slot the students do I think it's 20 minutes of presentation, 20 minutes for the subject matter experts that we invite to give feedback, which is awesome. 
that's actually how I got associated with the school was um, that I was able to uh, come and be a subject matter expert in planning. So that's how I, that's how we found each other. Other than I also, Elijah, knew a bunch of Conway grads and was a hiring manager. And I will tell you, if I saw that somebody went to the Conway school, it went to the top of the stack because I know they know how to work with people and presentations and all the good things. So uh, we call those formal presentations or works in progress. They're only about two thirds done at this point. We're not like some design schools that wait till the end and oh, you make your grand presentation and you're done. Bless you, go on. We do it at about two thirds of the way done so that we can get all this expertise into it and feedback and um, all those good things. So then the second community meeting will be around March 4th or so, and then we'll get the drafts to the clients on or about the 17th, and then you have three days to make the final comments. That's not to say that you haven't seen drafts along the way, you of course will have, but this is the last, you know, it gets sent out, we have three days. It's a very tight schedule, I know, but um, so plan on, having some kind of meaning during that time frame uh, where you can mm. you know consolidate your comments and kind of agree on uh, final wording and then um, by the end of april is usually when we get um, the final documents back from the printer uh, so it's you know about a month into our spring semester that those get delivered so any questions about kind of the timing of things process no yeah I know. at what uh, point will you have specific dates for the ones that are by x y and z like by march 4th by the things that we have to show up at yeah yeah i think that's part of what you'll talk about with your team at the first meeting got it okay thank you uh, I know everybody wants to plan ahead, so I would suggest that that first meeting, you set a date for the first community or stakeholder uh, engagement session, okay? Yeah. I think that's that's wise because that'll be either the 10th or the 12th of January, and then two, three weeks later is when the meeting would be. So if you schedule that ahead of time, that's helpful. And just to know Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are best for the students. We do invited lectures, lecturers on Thursdays. And wow, having Zoom has really changed that so much, so much mm -hmm. diversity and people from all over the world really are coming to speak on Thursday afternoons. So they have to be back in class by four, uh, back at the, at the school by four on Thursdays. So um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are the best days for those. So yeah, so uh, the only thing that I still need from this group is when you wanna have your first uh, student team meeting, and you can talk about that after I'm gone. It's either the 10th or the 12th. On the 10th, it's one o'clock till, I'm saying, seven or so for start times and then on the 12th it's one and they till four and they have to be done at four to attend their lecture so that makes sense hannah and i've been emailing about this so we just need to set that first date and you know i mean you don't even really have to de decide today but um I just, you know, I've got my little chart and I, I want to fill in that box and uh, get everything taken care of. So that's great. So we're looking forward to working with you all. Um, uh, as you may have seen, Plainfield did a similar project. Um, uh, FERCOG has done, uh, Franklin Regional Council of Governments has done, um, uh, sustainability and resilience uh, plans like the like this one uh, so there's some there's some emerging models to look at and uh, we'll connect you with all that so great thank you for your time um, um 
Yes, CJ, ma'am. just a quick question before you head out. Um, the community stakeholder meetings, is that community engagement with a broader community group or is that with our core group? So your core group will meet maybe every other week or so throughout the semester. It, it's up to you how much you want to meet. The community and stakeholder meetings are the larger, you know, I'm from the South, so, so the y'all come kind of meetings that are just open to everyone. Okay. Unless unless you decide, you know, I, I, I don't like to box students mm -hmm. in about how the community engagement will go, but some communities have like the first meeting, well, they announced that, hey, we're doing this thing, but the first meeting might be a, a smaller group of uh, more engaged, more, you know, um, uh, what I want to say, I don't want to say informed, but, you know, not the, hey, let's have everybody come and comment. I want to, you know, I want to leave some flexibility in that. Um, a lot of times the first meeting is, hey, we did all these maps and what do you think of these maps? And people love to interact with maps. And, you know, um, we've mm -hmm. figured out ways to draw on Zoom. So <laughs> that's kind of cool. Uh, so people can interact with maps that way as well as uh, physically in a meeting. Uh, so, you know, sometimes that's what the first meeting is about. You know, the second meeting is, usually more about, hey, we're making these recommendations, we're getting close to the end, what you know, what are you thinking about? But that first one can be kind of whatever you feel, you know, makes sense based on, you know, when was the last MVP meeting that was kind of a y'all come? It's been a couple of years. Yeah. So yeah, the planning took place before I started at Waitley in 2020 and 2021. Okay, so yeah. so it's been a while since there's been this kind of, and you haven't done any master planning or anything in the meantime? We've done some planning efforts. We have a housing production plan in process, um, and we have other planning processes that are about to begin. So we've had continual community engagement. Um, and I think we can kind of keep the ball rolling on that. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just kind of testing the weather around, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can only bombard a community with community meetings only so much. And um, mm -hmm. we were actually gonna do, we're doing an open space and recreation plan for Chesterfield uh, where I live this, um, I'm the chair of the planning board in Chesterfield, mm -hmm. full disclosure. And we were supposed to do it last year. And last year there was just so much going on in town, so many other things. And I'm like, this climate just isn't right for doing a focused planning project. So that's why I always kind of try to take the temperature of the community. And, you know, if you're in a good place uh, and and that's not to say we wouldn't do the project, but it might happen in a different way if people were kind of burned out or over-engaged. And, and uh, so something to consider as you're figuring out how you want to go about uh, doing engagement. Yeah, absolutely. And I trust too that this group especially has good connections in the community. I'm sure you guys can shake the tree and get people involved too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking that Waitley 250 is over. So there's a whole bunch of people who are used to being busy. Who yeah. aren't, aren't exactly. as busy as they were this time last year. So I'm hopeful. That's perfect. There you have it. That would be a good stakeholder list to start with. And that's, uh, let me just mention that good segue. Uh, what are the client's responsibilities as we move through this process? That's the biggest one is getting people to engage. That Hannah knows I've been bugging her. Uh, uh, <laughs> So bugging them about getting a stakeholder list, <laughs> get that list. And uh, it could be, you know, every town elected and appointed official, just emails. And and so I think that uh, Hannah's a good planner. So uh, Hannah, the planner. <laughs> so they're on it. Awesome. Cool. Okay, well, thank you so much, CJ. I really appreciate it.
Um, does anybody else have any other questions? I don't want to take you to or take up too much of your time, CJ. Yeah. No, I, I don't have any other questions. I'm good. I don't either. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, CJ. Great. And if you do end up having questions or you think about it, um, get them to Hannah and we'll connect. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, CJ. Good oh, to meet you, I need CJ. To stop sharing. There we go. Great. Bye now. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to leave the room for just a moment. I'll be right back. Okay, I cool. Was also going to say, actually, my job is calling me right now. I need to hop off, but I'll oh. be back on Let's as soon as I can. Take a two minute break. So awesome. I'll that be sounds back. great. Super. All right. All right. Two minute break. I'm going to get my water. Me Perfect. Too. Okay. <laughs> great. Okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long the work call with Eli will take, um, and I don't want to keep you guys too long, so I figure maybe we could get started, and then Eli sure. can jump in when he gets back. And Eli is one of the students? No, right? Eli yeah. lives in Waitley. Um, he's on the committee. I think oh, okay. CJ was just trying to get him to apply to the Conway School. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Um, okay, he's a Waitley resident. So he's, uh, okay, excellent. And he's cool. on housing, right, Hannah? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And we need some gender diversity on this committee. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Um, age diversity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know what we have, you know. Yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Okay, cool. So, as I was saying before, uh, we have this kind of list of research questions in the contract. Um, you could spend a whole semester on any one of them. I can pull up the contract and show you the list too. Yeah, I'm pretty sure um, I opened it up somewhere in the background here. Totally. <laughs> I'm sure I'm just having trouble finding it. That happens to me all the time. Um, yeah, so this is the what the contract looks like. It's from the Conway School. Um, it's got this list of questions on the second, the first and second page. I highlighted a couple of them that I thought were interesting that we haven't really gotten to explore in any other planning processes so far. And I haven't really seen any grants specifically geared towards these questions. Um, if the committee is interested in other questions, I'm also totally happy to highlight those in any student interactions um, and start pulling up some data sources and areas for research that are related to those. Um, the other reason why I highlighted this social issues question, especially, is because we have some recommendations that are in the MVP community resilience building risk matrix um, that are related to that question under environmental farms. Um, CISA works with local farmers to increase their resili resiliency, excuse me. Um, so partnering with CISA basically to talk about like migrant worker justice and advocacy. Um, and farming and land use in that lens. So yeah, some food for thought. Um, are there any other questions that folks are interested in pursuing? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I'm gonna, I'm, I've got my PDF copy. I'm gonna start, I'm, I've got that page up. What, um, and I see with the one that you mentioned there. On the next page, you also- um, Yeah. So uh, when we were initially talking about this project at the select yeah. board meeting, um, Julie especially seemed really excited about the uh, potential carbon sequestration avenues that we yeah, could pursue. Yeah. So I highlighted that one as well. Okay. I, I, um, I would love to, wait. first of all, I, I'm really excited to sort of look at this all from the housing lens. So I think that's a great place because it's infrastructure. It's, yeah, it addresses so many things. Um, Regarding the carbon sequestration, I um I I was talking to Phil um, Corman um, uh, just last week, and what was really interesting to me was, um, you know, CISA is doing such amazing things, and one of the things that I think would be really fun to support them with, because I think it's one it's it's a dilemma for them, is the the fact that like you know, farming and carbon sequestration is so interrelated, but they haven't been able to focus on that because the no-till is so, um, it's so, and that, or not, um, it's, it would be, such, it, I think it's such a huge barrier for farmers that they're like, oh, I don't even want to deal with that. And I, I suspect that there are ways to 
um, amplify carbon sequestration without having to go no-till. And so that mm -hmm. seems like a, um, I'm, I'm really excited that this line is here because I would love to be able to support them more. You know, they, they have so much on their plate right now and I think it'd be really yeah. neat to do that. And also- What is, what is no-till? Well, no till, you know, tilling the land is like the classic, um, you know, what you farm. Yeah, and yeah. It, and it disrupts all of the, the microbiome that's um, just doing so many amazing things to fix carbon. And so no till is sort of the ultimate way you farm so as not to disrupt that. And mm -hmm. anyone that knows more than me, please weigh in, but this is my understanding. And then low till is still, going along those lines, but maybe, you know, hand weeding, which is a lot too, but, and, and I'm certainly no expert, but I said, but my understanding is just putting compost on your lawn, even if you did nothing else, fixes carbon. So it seems like there's a hierarchy that we could, you know, support and hand yeah. is not. So maybe I got that right. And one, so one other thing I just wanted to mention just as sort of a, a global, approach here is, um, have you guys heard of um, uh, Doug Tallamy? Not specifically. Um, he He's an advocate for backyard national parks. Mm -hmm. And so am I. <laughs> um, and it's basically this idea of not only is it great to plant um, um, uh, native species, but there are some native species that are even more kick-ass than others. And if you plant native species anywhere, it's great. So like borders of farms, you know, median strips of highways, the, the, um, the area right outside my yard here uh, along Chestnut Plain Road, you know, there are all these opportunities to disrupt the, um, the desert that the lawn is. And so I, you know, as we do this, it's such a great way to fix carbon, create biodiversity, um, and, and it's something that anyone can do. And so just inserting that in here. Mm. That's cool. I'm an, I'm a very avid gardener. So yeah, check it out. Uh, Doug, mm. look up his website, Doug Tallamy. He has these wonderful, um, videos where he, he's an entomologist and he's wicked smart. And he, um, he just, as an example, you know, he gives this hierarchy of local species and the oak tree is number one because it, it harbors 500 species, mm. um, which is really good. Um, so anyway, you, I, I, I figured this would be a group that would be interested in it. And it just seems like a, a really fun thing to involve the town in because anyone can do yeah. it. Yeah. Anyone can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, hooking up with that, I was looking at the the list from the MVP. Is that correct? Um, about uh, invasive species, and boy, you know, I'm an avid gardener, and directly across the street, we are beset with bittersweet. Um, so, the the balance between planting more native species and getting more biodiversity and then getting rid of some of the invasives that are kind of choking out other stuff is would be high on my list. Right. I mean, those are all great things. And it's, um, I guess, uh, maybe the question for me is, um, we were looking at climate resilience. Mm. And the native species are going to change as the climate changes, right? That's it's, very true. So yes. I it, it's at some point um, I I hope we'll link things back to um, the climate. to resilience against climate change. I think yep. the soil stuff is super super important because that's yep. how we can help mitigate by having strong um, local food supplies to support that because it, everything else is going to um <laughs> everything else is, is going to hurt the soils and so anything we can do to keep soils healthy um and even if it were just if could we somehow find a local fund for cover cropping because i think all the farmers oh, yeah. would love to do it uh when they got paid to do it or got the costs covered through the government everybody did it and then when that funding goes away they don't do it. So could we uh, right. even, you know, till no till 
that's probably the farmers are going to have to answer that one if they're willing to do the extra work for that. I understand if you do it, then eventually it's you're much, much better off than if you don't. But um, so we might be able to figure out a way to help encourage those. Um, but could we identify a, a sustainable method to fund just cover cropping in our town? Um, I don't know if that's really a local, I mean, maybe that issue is not uh, something that we can take on, but maybe that's a question to ask at least. Um, things that will help us conserve the soil because the quality of the soil is so important to being adaptable to climate change. Yeah, and Joyce, yep. I completely agree with you that my, my point about the native species is that the pollinators are also essential, of course. And so that oh. idea of um, supporting the farmers through all of these different ways that, mm. you know, because it turns out it's all one big system. So, but I completely agree. The And the the point that we're working with CESA is just, I mean, it's so exciting. And um, mm. yeah, anyway, yeah. but I, I, I agree with you that like having practical, pragmatic, specific things like that um, yeah. are gonna be important. Right. So, yeah. So right now in this list, things uh, that we're talking about are, are kind of linked to this list through the carbon sequestration but maybe if there, there might be a better way to word one of these bullet points to support local sustainable agriculture um and it's going to overlap with carbon sequestration yep um as well so i guess it's not necessarily in here specifically but i think this this was a this was a list you know a uh kind of throw it out there list that is to be amended, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the second to last one, I think, are there mar models of current carbon sequestration that could be applied and how could the town or individual property owners participate could probably expand to talk about, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. agricultural properties and businesses as well. And trees, right. like trees and soil, right? So, I, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's hmm. a really important line i'm so glad you highlighted it hannah because yeah because we have farms which um have soil which are my understanding is the the three real carbon sequestration systems are trees the oceans and soil and so mm. um and we don't have an ocean but we have trees and soil so um mm -hmm. uh, so supporting CESA and the farmers to identify the ways that even if it's not no-till can um you know yeah understand the hierarchy and Joyce that that point of cover crops it'd be interesting to know which ones are best at fixing yeah. carbon and um mm. yeah um yeah. so supporting CISA to explore these because like I said what was surprising to me and I'd love to have a conversation with them is that because they're working on equity, I think that's one of their main fo foci. <laughs> they're really not looking at carbon sequestration. And so I feel like we could really facilitate that. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other thing is I, um, I am a big fan of Waitley trees and there are some really freaking amazing trees in this town. And I would love to see us make that, make an effort to um, um, support preserving them. Um, because that's another carbon sequestration op opportunity. What, you know, watching these beautiful maples suffering out here is um, heartbreaking. So mm -hmm. not that we can do much about that, but, um, but you know, keeping trees on our mind, I think, and, ha and having them front and center here would be, I would love to see that. Yeah. I don't know what you guys think. Cool. Yeah. Hey, also, another... Sorry. No, you, you go ahead first. I was going to, I'm actually changing the subject slightly to a different bullet point, the watershed scale conditions affecting water okay. quality, um, okay. because I'm, I'm thinking that as climate changes, we run into the problem a little bit less here in the east, but I did visit a friend in Colorado and uh, water I mean, it's going to, she's afraid that eventually within several years, it's going to come down to basically people shooting each other over access to water. Um, and we are lucky enough to have access to more water here, but I think it makes sense to look at what we've got and protect it and um, 
make sure that we have access to good water. And I did read that thing on the spreadsheet about the wells in Waitley being kind of close together. Um, and so making sure that we have um, good clean water and a variety of different sources would seem to be, especially as the climate changes and things dry up, would be beneficial. I hope that made some sense. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I'm hearing yes. a few different key threads of like biodiversity and ecological management, agriculture and soil management, as it kind of ties in with that. Um, and then this water part too, do those feel like the three primary parts of what we've discussed? Yeah, I was going to throw another carbon sequestration thing in totally. because it relates to soils. And that is um, biochar. Oh, if, yes. uh, if there were something that, um, that we could do to promote um, biochar, because that enriches the soils, sequesters carbon. So many uh, things that I don't know what they is, are. What is oh, biochar? biochar? Essentially, you, you, heat the, uh, you heat up um, organic waste. Um, tree branches you know you, when you have a dead tree you do have to take those down but if they just decompose then that becomes well greenhouse gases but if you heat them in a low oxygen environment it becomes charcoal which is much more stable and you just grind that up and you put it in the soil oh, wow. uh, and it enriches yeah. the soil helps the soil absorb more water and um but it uh, you need a facility sort of to do that uh -huh. Um, and I would love to see a biochar facility in the Waitley Industrial Park. <laughs> that would be so cool. <laughs> that would be cool, wouldn't it? Um, operated on solar power even, but I, but, but, you know, I don't know that that, I mean, that, that's something that would have to be looked into. Is that, uh, too energy intensive? I don't really know. So. Can I ask you, Joyce? Um, yeah. uh, would that include compost stuff? Oh, uh, not the wet compost. I don't think I think it's mostly things like dry. It'd be dry stuff Excellent. for the most part. I've seen it done mostly with like tree branches and like dried up, um, you know, bits of, yeah, it's mostly wood. Um, so waste wood, but um, I don't know. I would have to look into whether things like, um, like some of the, the, like the corn stalk waste from the cornfields. Could oh. that be biochar? I don't know. Neat. But that's it's a neat idea to um, have sort of a a local industry that is climate resilient, climate supportive. Yeah, I, I like that way of thinking. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Cool. I love it. This I'm is so great. So much Thank you from this discussion. I just want to say <laughs> that's awesome. Really. Nice. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh no, that was it. Cool. <laughs> Um, so the other big part of this meeting is that I was hoping we might be able to generate a list of potential stakeholders, um, either individuals or organizations or individuals at organizations. Um, so far I have CISA, the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, in case we wanted to talk to anybody about migrant workers, um, FERCOG. And then if we were going to talk about housing at all, which it sounds like we're kind of moving away from that, that's totally fine. I had the Franklin County Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority, um, are there any other organizations you guys can think of that might be really important to reach out to or I'm any individuals? About, um, I'm a graphic designer and one of my clients is Norse Farms. I was just mm. thinking Norse Farms too. Folks at Norse Farms because they've got migrant workers. They're, you know, heavily involved in agriculture, of course, blah, blah, blah. They, they definitely have stakes in the game. Yeah. Cool. I, um, I, I would hate to really move away from housing. Maybe, maybe it's a, and maybe it's necessary if we're going to limit the bullet points. It just seems like it is very much dovetails with the mm -hmm. issues of farming, particularly. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned, or maybe it was in the Conway School uh, letter, the point about town people in town um, being aware of people moving to more rural areas. Um, because of COVID, et cetera. I think how is um, um, infrastructure planning or rather, what, what am I talking about? Housing planning that uh, recognizes and protects open space and also recognizes the necessity for us to um, embrace 
people moving here, including migrant workers who might need housing. So I think mm -hmm. I, I, I feel strongly that it has to be part of the conversation or, or I would love it, let's say. And I know Elijah's on the um, housing committee. So anyway, yeah. um, I, 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 would, I would also be uncomfortable to, you know, tossing housing just because we got enthusiastic about the second one you put a star on. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah. I hope we can talk about both. Yeah. But that said, the the fourth bullet point on the first page, how can green energy solutions be carefully integrated into the rural <laughs> landscape? Um there's going to be funding for that because of the the IRA and I don't mean the Irish Republican Army. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean that 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 not that's oh so nicely named bill that uh, got passed. Um and I, I think any pressure we can take off of farmers is good. We have an example of a dual use solar and farm fields right up there in Deerfield. And um, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, uh, because I haven't looked into it very much, um, but I had a student in my renewable energy and climate change course wrote her final project on uh, on basically, uh, she was talking about, you know, animals and re renewable energy. And she went into it thinking, renewable energy, that's so bad for the birds. And at the end of it, she's like, renewable energy is so good for the birds. <laughs> and, and, uh, and one of the things she cited was the farm mm -hmm. at UMass, uh, the one in Deerfield. Um, and so I haven't looked at that in a while, but I'm wondering if there's some lessons learned there that would be good for farmers to be able to incorporate renewable energy. I know our planning board does oh. not believe that you can have farming and solar panels on the same piece of land in spite of, you know, anything that exists as possible. They don't go for that. But um, I think that's that's something. Um, so I'm going to put a star on, um, on that one as well. Mm -hmm. um, and... I, I suspect if, you know, with, with those three bullet points and the way we've sort of um, widened that, the one about carbon sequestration to include uh, anything that's good for the soils, um, that might be more than they can do in one planning round. They might ask us to cut back, but it's, but it's easier to cut back than it is to, to fill in probably, right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. it. I, I agree, Joyce. I think that's really important to have that conversation. So thank you. Yeah, because yeah. you know, income for farmers. You know that that uh, yep. because they they <clears throat> have so many other things that are uncertain. Um, having something that's certain would be good, and knowing yep. what kinds of farms would be able to have dual use on that land yep. um, is um, is important. They were do, they were doing a bit of grazing up there, I think, yep. uh, but they may be doing other things that I'm just not really aware of. Yeah. And I don't know how many small farms are in the area. I mean, I said Norse, but, you know, Dave Chamutka is right down the road from us. Mm -hmm. and he produces enough to be able to sell things at River Valley Co-op. So yeah. I'm sure there are other much smaller right. scale farmers who are right. doing a variety of things that might who might be considered stakeholders or would be interested. Yeah. My understanding is that neither of those farms are the ones that have trouble with housing their migrant workers. So there is one farm that is has repeatedly been in trouble with the, the conditions of the housing for their workers. And I don't know where that fits in here, if that makes them a stakeholder or someone whose problem we're trying to help solve. I, yeah. I, so there, I, I don't know enough about the situation. Maybe Are you allowed uh, to say which farm Elijah that is? Might know. Are you allowed to say which farm that is just for information or is that not? It's been in the newspaper. So that, I okay. mean, Chang, Chang Farm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Citations on the quality of the housing right, right. for their, for their workers. Yeah. Thank you. I did see that. Okay. Um, okay. So it's getting a little bit close to one. I don't want to take up too much of your days. Um, do you think these last few minutes would be better spent coming up with a good meeting time for the student team, or would you like to throw out a last few thoughts? What do folks think? I think a meeting time is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. that's probably a good idea. Great. Welcome back, Elijah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm sorry I had to pop up there. Oh, no okay. problem. 
Uh, so our two options for meeting with the student team are January 10th, anytime between one and seven. It doesn't have to be that whole span. It's just um, about an hour, hour and a half meeting mm -hmm. within that window um, or January 12th at uh, between one and four. Um, so about whichever would work I've for folks a, better. I've got a board meeting. It starts at six and maybe Julia does. Julie does too. Yes, um, I do. <laughs> but other than uh, that, but all the, the times that you mentioned are open on my calendar, so. Yeah, prior to five on the 10th or uh, in between the hours designated on the 12th would be fine for me too. Okay, I can do any time on the 12th. Okay. Um, I'm, I've got a 1.30 to 2.30 on the 12th, but after that I'm, I'm free and I'm free the entire time on the 10th. Okay, cool. So maybe let's say 3 p.m. on the 12th. Does that work for everybody? Perfect. It works for me. Super. So, I will let CJ know. Is that an hour long meeting? Yeah, let's yeah. make when that enough. Yeah, they have to. They have to be. They have to be at some other meeting at four, and be good to know if that was a Zoom meeting or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it's um, if it's not a Zoom and they actually need it to be over by three thirty, um, would two thirty to three thirty work for you, Elijah? That'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stretch that out on my calendar, block out that part, and Hannah will let us know which ends up working best. Perfect. Awesome, great. Okay, everybody, this has been so productive. I'm so excited to have so many areas to explore. Thank you so much. I yeah. this is awesome. Yes. This is great. Thank and we you. we Thank love you. Hannah too. Thank you, Elijah. <laughs> We're so happy. <laughs> We're so happy you're making all this possible. Yeah. yeah. I've it's been bragging. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, you enjoy the holidays, and I will be in touch with next steps.